Welcome everybody um, to uh, the Spurgle lecture this year um, with uh, Dr. Elodie Geddon. And um, before uh, I introduce her fully, uh, I would like to acknowledge that the Spurgle lecture series is uh, made possible by a generous gift uh, from David Spurgle uh, and the Spurgle family uh, in honor of uh, one of York's founding faculty and my mentor, uh, Dr. Martin Spurgle. Uh, who's also joined us this afternoon. Uh, great to see you again, Marty. And um, uh, I'd like to invite David to uh, say some opening uh, remarks, and then I'll introduce our speaker for the day. So, Tim, thanks. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, come to and help support this series. Uh, my father, uh, Martin Spurl, was one of the founding faculty at York. Uh, was there for his really his entire career, uh, helped build the natural sciences program at York, served as chair of natural scientists, and was very active in helping to build and create uh, the faculty there. And uh, one of the things I wanted to do for his 80th birthday was honor him, uh, honor York College, which is also a place which where I first went and met uh, scientists when I would go in with my dad. So uh, I also owe a debt uh, to York and uh, to provide an opportunity to bring outstanding lecturers uh, to York across natural sciences in a uh, annual program. And that's what motivated uh, me and my family to uh, endow this lecture series. And uh, really pleased to see the lecture series thriving. Um, like all of us disappointed that we're not yet in person, but I think we're all very hopeful. Uh, if not this year, next year, uh, we will all be together in Jamaica and look forward to uh, uh, seeing you all there, but uh, in person, but for now it's uh, fabulous uh, that so many of you can uh, join on Zoom. So looking forward to the talk. Thanks, Tim. All right, thank you very much, David. <clears throat> and. Um... Uh, York is really, really appreciative of, of uh, your gift to the college, uh, and um, yeah, we're we're excited to continue this uh, as we move forward. So we cycle through the natural sciences, uh, starting with with physics, which was Marty's uh, field here, and 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 then biology. And next year we'll do a chemistry speaker, and then come back to physics and geology again. Uh, so it's always an exciting time that we can in, in invite some you know really world renowned scientists onto campus and interact with the students. So thanks a lot. It's really very much appreciated. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Elodie Geddon. Um, she leads the systems genomics section at the Laboratory of Parasitic Diseases of the Nat National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institutes of Health, the NIH in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, she's been there since uh, May 2020. Um, she also holds an affiliation with NYU, where she was director of the Center for Genomics and Systems Biology and professor of biology and global public health. Uh, she was scheduled to come here from NYU last year, literally the week we closed. So uh, this has been a long time in planning. Really, really uh, happy to have you here, here, <laughs> Elodie, after all this time. Her laboratory uses comparative genomics, evolutionary biology, and systems biology techniques to generate critical insight about host pathogen interactions. Dr. Geddon studies microbial and viral population structures and how these impact host response to infection and emerging infectious diseases. <clears throat> Her research focuses on characterizing virus diversity, primarily influenza, and now, no surprise, SARS-CoV-2 within and across infected hosts and the interactions of microbes, like bacterial, fungal, and viral in the respiratory tract to better understand the dynamics of virus transmission. Uh, Dr. Geddon obtained her uh, Bachelor of Science and PhD from uh, McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Um, ooh, as a Boston Bruins fan, I, I won't hold that against you. So I, oh, I didn't notice that before. <clears throat> Um, she is a MacArthur Foundation Fellow from 2011 and a Kavli Frontier of Science Fellow in 2012 and an American Academy of Microbiology Fellow from 2017. 
And so it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Elodie Geddon uh, for today's Martin Spurgle Lecture. Well, thank you very much, Tim. And thank you for the invitation. Yes, sadly, it would have been uh, more fun in person. And I remember last year, um, it was scheduled for March 12. And I remember writing to you on March 10, 11. I said, is this really going forward in person? And you said, yeah, yeah. And then I think the day before you said, oh, you know, the whole world shut down, as you all know. And the world shut down because of viruses. And this is actually the same title I had last year. And uh, when Tim said, well, do you want to update what you'll talk about? I realized not really, because it's still apropos, as we would say in French. So first, Tim mentioned that I'm now at the National Institutes of Health. And in case you don't know what the NIH is, um, it's one of the largest biomedical research institutions in the world. So it's uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, and it's considered actually the highest density of MDs and PhDs in the world is in Bethesda. Um, and uh, here's what we call our dude wall. It's uh, the Nobel Prize laureates that came out of the NIH. There are a few women peppered in there, believe it or not, and there will be more, we're hoping, in the future. Uh, but most people know the NIH uh, from the news through this guy. And uh, this is uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci that we've seen a lot in the news. And he's not the director of the NIH, that would be Francis Collins. He's the director of, of the institute where I work, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, which we call NIAID or N-I-A-I-D. And so NIAID has as a, as a mission to work on all sorts of pathogens and viruses are very hot right now, as you can well imagine. And you know, when I uh, decided to give this title this type of lecture, I wanted to focus not necessarily on emerging infections, but today what I'll do is give you a little bit of a sampling of different viruses. And one thing to know is that viruses are the most dominant, numerous entity in the world. And this is in a liter of water. And this is simple fluorescence microscopy from a paper uh, that's quite old now, but uh, still highly relevant. And it shows you how in these big blobs of light, you have what are here bacteria, here are protists, and protists are unicellular organisms. And then these small little dots represent viruses. And, uh, you know, the, the sort of the ratio would be about uh, 10 to 1 between viruses and bacteria in a liter of seawater. This is what this image is. And the point is that viruses are dominant in this ecosystem, but it's true also in our human ecosystem and the field of microbiome research. So I do work on the microbiome and also on viruses. And the microbiome is really all the organisms, microorganisms that are present in your or on your body. And you can see again, this ratio of 10 to one of viruses to bacteria. So viruses are very important in the world. Right. And uh, I like to show this uh, because we have a few uh, astronomers and astrophysicists and this number, Tim, I don't know if it's correct, but 10 to the 22 stars. But if you look at what we consider the potential number of viruses in the biosphere is 10 to the 31, you can see that it's a, a big, much larger uh, magnitude in number. And in that, there's a very large potential for virus diversity. Now, one thing to consider is that when we talk about viruses, we're talking about different types of things. A virus is not a virus. So when we hear about the SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, we're talking about eukaryotic viruses. So these are viruses that infect eukaryotes. We are eukaryotes. But when I was showing you this liter of seawater, what we're seeing mostly are bacteriophages. And those are phage viruses that infect bacteria. Now, one thing you may never have you may never have heard of are virophages, and that's a, a pretty recent discovery. 
And these are actually viruses of viruses. And I'll show you a little bit on that towards the end of, of my talk. But what I want to do is really take you a little bit through the diversity of what exists in the virus world. And that's why I wanted to cover eukaryotic viruses and bacteriophages. And you know we're very much immersed in the eukaryotic virus world right now. Virologists have become very cool. And I've had people saying, oh, I wish I was a virologist, which I think is hilarious because uh, nobody has ever envied us in, you know, before. Uh, but I want to show you the virus diversity that even exists in eukaryotic viruses. And there too, a virus is not a virus. So DNA viruses are not the same thing as RNA viruses. So actually, a viro virologist that is specialized in DNA viruses knows not that much about viruses of the RNA world or RNA viruses. Um, and in fact, a DNA and an RNA virus are, you know, probably far more different than a clam and an elephant would be, for example. I don't even know if that's a good analogy. But what I want to show you here is even the diversity in morphologies and the shape of these viruses. And we have what are called enveloped and non-enveloped viruses. And the envelope refers to the fact that certain viruses, when they infect cells, will then cover themselves with part of the surface of these cells and take the lipids and the, the cell surface uh, that represent their envelope. And some viruses are not enveloped. They don't uh, require this to, um, to then propagate. Now, our favorite virus is that SARS-CoV-2. So that's coronavirus. Here's my favorite virus, that's influenza. And in fact, those three viruses, the paramyxo, corona, and ortho, are responsible for some of the more recent pandemics that we've seen and um, important epidemics of the last 20 years. And that's something to keep in mind that RNA viruses, envelope viruses are often the, constitute often the majority of emerging diseases. And here's our SARS-CoV-2 responsible for COVID-19. Now, if we're talking about viral dark matter, and this term is very general, some people hate it, I actually love it because it's representative of the diversity that exists in the virus world in that we can start probing with genomics. And I'll go into that a little bit more. But if we consider a back of the envelope calculation of how many viruses remain to be discovered in mammals, in mammalian host species, well, a few years ago, there was a paper that did this type of calculation using genomics, where they would collect samples and just decode what was there and try to determine per mammalian species that they tested, how many virus species could be found. And their number was approximately 55 species of viruses per mammalian species. Now, how many mammalian species exist in the world? Well, we think it's something around 5,500. And so if you do a rapid calculation, what do you have is probably about 300,000 unknown viruses that remain to be discovered that can infect mammalian species. So when you see this kind of number, it's not all that surprising that we do see uh, emerging infections that occur in the world because there is a very large unprobed virome or viral world that exists out there. Now, if you want to start looking at what is out there, where do you look? Right. So um, this is a classic representation of what an epidemiologist would present in a course. And what you have here is the circulation of viruses in different reservoirs. And we call reservoirs animal species that basically are hosts to certain viruses that are often not pathogenic 
to that host, but are present at a high diversity. As an example, influenza infects a lot of aquatic birds and the birds are not sick. So it's not a disease really. Um, it's just an infection that they don't feel, an asymptomatic infection. What happens when you have an emerging infection is that you often get this, what we call a cross-species spillover. And this happens constantly. We just never hear about it because it would be one individual that gets infected, is sick, nobody knows what that person has, and we can call it disease X or influenza-like symptoms or whatever the symptoms are. This happens constantly. And at some point there can be one in this lottery of viruses that cross the species barrier you can get what's called the stuttering chain and that's when one individual is infected through this zoonotic infection but can give it to other individuals but it dies there where it never moves forward and we call that a stuttering chain and that's when the reproductive number or what you may have heard also as referred to as the R0 or R0 is below one. So less than one person infected. So there's no transmission. But of course, we've seen that sometimes you hit what's called epidemics. And that's when the R0 is more than one. And of course, that's what we've seen with SARS-CoV-2. So you can see how this lottery can happen. Very high number of viruses that exist in animal species contact with human populations. And this contact has increased in uh, the last few decades. And so you can get this uh, spillover happening and the emergence of a new epidemic. And these are the major emerging zoonotic outbreaks uh, that have occurred in, um, since 1994. And three of those are coronaviruses. We have paramyxoviruses right here. And we have a phylovirus here. And I'm not even showing influenza with the 2009 pandemic of influenza. The reason I'm only showing these guys is that it is thought, and for some of them has been proven, that these were viruses of bat origin. And why bats? Well, bats have a very high diversity. There are many different species of bats and bats carry themselves a high number and high diversity of viruses. And bats often are environments where there's encroachment by human populations. And so you get this interaction with uh, wildlife, with the bat and humans, bat and animals that are a source of protein to humans. And so you can get these epidemics. And in this case, some of those being, of course, pandemics. And I like to show this when I talk about coronaviruses, because of course it appears that the coronaviruses was something so new for us in the human population. But in fact, we've had coronaviruses circulating in human populations for uh, quite a few decades. And those um, just lead to what are flu-like symptoms or just a very light, light cold, a, a small cold. You don't even know what you're infected with. But we have four different human coronaviruses that have been circulating uh, during flu season. And of course now three different other coronaviruses uh, that have been far more important because of their pandemic potential. And now with SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 being what we're in the middle of. So coronaviruses are uh, not new to the human population. They are what we would have expected as a virus uh, epidemiologist that, you know, coronaviruses are a good source um, of these epidemics. And so I was mentioning the encroachment of human population, and this is uh, what happens when you have a clash of populations, very large mega cities, expanding populations, deforestation that forces a link uh, between or a contact that didn't exist before between human, uh, dense human populations and wildlife. <clears throat> 
And of course, rapid air travel hasn't helped. Here, here's a map of worldwide air transportation, this network, um, and we see how important it is. And that's why in the case of an emerging infection, an outbreak, a pandemic, uh, travel is often the first thing that is um, uh, halted. Now, I'm a genomics person. That means I decode genomes of different pathogens. I'm interested in parasites, viruses, bacteria. And in the, for surveillance of emerging viruses, um, the tools of genomics are great. And you can do surveillance of emerging viruses, and it's very efficient at the identification of what is circulating. And that's what we've been seeing a lot when you hear these reports of SARS-CoV-2 variants that are emerging. This is all determined through viral genomics, decoding of genomes through the analysis of samples. And normally, the scope of these types of surveillance efforts lead to thousands of virus isolates or thousands of virus genomes that are decoded. Well, right now with SARS-CoV-2, we are at 1.4 million virus sequences that have been generated. So 1.4 million genomes. I think it's a little bit under 1.4 million. This has never happened. We've never had such a huge database of information on a virus. This is unique. And the strategy to decode a genome in the case of you know, something like SARS-CoV-2, this is a little schema of what would be the genome of the virus that I'm representing as a, a, just a linear uh, representation of this genome. And what I have here is these little bars are simply how we anchor primers. And so we basically will start amplifying by PCR portions of the genome so that we can then decode it or sequence it and then reassemble it into a full genome. So we go from a sample, we extract the RNA because SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA genome, not a DNA genome. And then we do this. So this is a, a targeted approach to sequencing. And so one thing that RNA viruses do very well is that every time they replicate, and that's the case of this virus, they make mistakes represented by my little X's here. That means you have all these genomes and all these mutations. And using that information, you can build what we call a phylogeny of information on an emergence of a virus and how it evolves through time. If you've never seen a phylogenetic tree, here's a schema of it on the left, and it's very much like a, um, a family tree where you have a common ancestor and then you work through the branches and the leaves would be your individual genomes. And in this case, these are my viruses that are the leaves. And depending on their relatedness, you can determine whether they fit into a group and so this is a representation of a large tree, and it's shown through time, and this would be December 2019 or early on when the first Wuhan virus genome was decoded. And then we see it up here in this graph to February 2021, and the colors indicate how this virus has evolved in slightly different ways by mutations, so that you have these different clades or lineages represented by colors. Now, what I'm showing here are point mutations. So they're just mutations that are markers of these different lineages. And these mutations are in one of the surface proteins, the spike protein that you I'm sure have heard about. And this uh, is important because mutations on the spike protein can change things about the, the surface protein and the antibodies you have thanks to the vaccine may, um, if the virus mutates too much, your antibodies may not be able to recognize the spike. So this is a quick primer on evolution of a virus and the diversity that exists. What has been surprising with this virus is 
the level of diversity that it has generated and how quickly we are seeing variants occurring constantly. Whether these variants are important phenotypically, whether they do have an impact or not, is what is being tested in various labs. Here's a representation of a, a subselection. I subselected some samples from the global tree. And what I wanted to highlight here is you see all these leaves or these dots represent the number of genomes. And as you can see, there was a, an increase in number of genomes decoded in December. And so it took a while before we were able to collect enough samples, sequence enough samples to know what is going on in the world. What has really facilitated this type of work at this point in time is the advancement of sequencing technology. And I like to show this, this was the sequencing facility that was the most cutting edge in 2004. And this was the J. Craig Venter Institute and Craig Venter was um, one of the scientists that uh, was involved in the Human Genome Project. And he also established an institute at which I worked at some point called TIGER, the Institute for Genomic Research, where the first bacteria genome was generated and that was uh, Haemophilus influenzae. But what I wanna show you here is that the sequencing capacity in 2004, this is 100 ABI 3730X. This was, you know, super cutting edge. A few years later, the whole capacity of this room could go in this instrument. And this is from Oxford Nanopore, it's the Minion. And actually that's an old picture of the Minion, but it's still a, um, a handheld instrument. And many in the UK who have been decoding the genomes of SARS-CoV-2 have been using this type of instrument. And it's a very rapid decoding. You can do it in just a few hours. So the technology uh, was ripe. And so that's why we know so much about this virus genomically because of the evolution of the technology that's been great. Now, one challenge of doing virus genome sequencing is that you do need to have a pretty high, what we call a virus titer. That means the infection has to be pretty high in the sample that's collected, or you have to culture the virus. And also in these studies, uh, you have to have a certain knowledge of the virus you're sequencing because when you collect a sample, you're not collecting just the virus, you're collected a lot of the human genome while you're doing that. And it, you know, to be able to do that, it can also sometimes take a while um, when you have to amplify the virus in some way. Now, some of the work uh, that I've been doing uh, recently is to develop in collaboration with a group at Penn State University, is a, uh, a device to enrich for virus particles. And uh, Yin Ting Ye, who goes by Tim, is a, an assistant professor at Penn State, but he has been a visiting scientist in my lab at NYU and now at NIH for a while. And um, Tim developed a, uh, here is just a little prototype of it, but it's a, a, a little device that we use to capture an enrich virus and getting rid, purifying basically the virus and getting rid of a lot of the other stuff so that we can do more rapid detection and, and uh, sequencing of the virus. And the way it's done, it's using carbon nanotubes. So if there are material physicists um, on the Zoom call, you are, uh, I'm sure, familiar with this. And um, basically what Tim does is that he grows these nano carbon nanotubes on a substrate and then depending on the intertubular distance or the distance between these nanotubes, he can size it per, uh, by different viruses. As I showed you before, viruses have different sizes. There's a lot of diversity and morphology, um, but you can do it so that you capture something like coronaviruses or influenza viruses. And now this is another prototype of this device. And this one is called the STEP, where it has slightly a different um, um, 
shape. Um, and here, the black is basically this, the carbon nanotubes, and you can run your viruses through it. Now, the beauty of this is that the viruses are held very tightly. And if I open the device, I can actually put mammalian cells on top and they will infect the mammalian cells and I can amplify in situ. What we can also do is scrape the viruses off the nanotubes and sequence them. Now, we published a paper last year, um, right before the pandemic, where we had done a slight different version of this uh, device, where we actually coated the carbon nanotubes with gold particles. And, um, and you could do detection with Raman spectroscopy. So basically, this would be the substrates where you can do a flow through of your sample. And this captures the viruses. And then depending on when you um, shine a laser onto the substrate, depending on the, um, uh, uh, the spectrum of light, the intensity that comes out, and depending on the shape of the spectra that you capture, you can actually separate out different viruses. Now, we're still pretty early on in this process, but we obtained a, an NSF grant that's part of a new program the NSS, NSF has on growing convergence research, where you can bring together people from different fields to try to address an important problem. And the problem we're addressing is evolution of influenza. And now we're doing um, coronaviruses. But um, our goal in this project is to eventually, so the NSF asks us to dream big. And so when we dream big, uh, we're thinking that what we'd like to do eventually is an handheld device where you could blow into it and by ramen get the detection and even capture some of the viruses for sequencing. Um, now, this is, we're not there yet, but that's what we're aiming, uh, we're aiming for with Tim and uh, with uh, Maurizio Terones, who's a physicist at Penn State, who's actually the PI of this, this grant. So talking about um, the virus genomics, as I showed it to you, where we're using a targeted approach and talking about this device to capture virus particles. So this device would fall in between what would be a targeted approach. We don't necessarily know exactly what we're looking for, but what you can do with virus genomics and to go into virus discovery more is to use uh, what I call the brute force approach. And the brute force approach is when you basically collect all the DNA or RNA from samples and you decode everything. And so ideally you'd want to have just viruses, but the truth is that you have bacteria, you have fungi, and you have human cells in the process so that you actually have to use very deep sequencing techniques and bioinformatics techniques to separate out the information. But what you can do is really have a more unbiased approach to virus discovery and discovery of what I call this viral dark matter. And so how does it work? And the, this field is called metagenomics and the biologists on this call, I'm sure are very familiar with this. Uh, but metagenomics is broadly the study of the collection of genetic material or the genomes from a mixed community. And you can do this from a surface, from your skin, from you know, saliva, you can do it from anything. And what you do is you extract everything, all DNA, all RNA, and then you pass it through your sequencing machine. And then it's bioinformatically, you try to reassemble the pieces of the puzzle into what would be individual genomes, be it a bacteria, a fungus, or a virus. And in this case, our interest is in viruses. Now your sample again contains everything. It contains all sorts of things. Um, but we're trying to focus on our viruses. And what I want to show you is very briefly two little pieces of uh, 
much larger studies that we're doing where we're using this metagenomics techniques. When we're talking about DNA, we can, the whole technique can broadly be called metagenomics, but usually it's when you're looking specifically at DNA is metagenomics. And when you're looking at the total RNA is meta transcriptomics. Now, total RNA will be your messenger RNA that code for proteins, but it will be also RNA of RNA virus genomes. And so you collect all of that. Now the RNA in these meta transcriptomic studies has to be translated or converted to DNA before it's decoded. And so the two studies I want to briefly mention, one is on influenza and one is on SARS-CoV-2. And the influenza study that we have is actually um, taking human samples from nasal washes and nasal swabs. I'm sure you've all had uh, tests of, for SARS-CoV-2. You've had, you know, you've been probed. Um, I'm hoping you're not getting the full nasopharyngeal, which you feel somebody's poking your brain. It's because they are, it goes pretty far back. And so we had um, hundreds of samples from about 60 individuals that came from different families um, where we had transmission. And that's what we call them high flu infection families. So that's where one individual was infected with flu and everybody else in the family. And we had samples from everybody. And we have these low infection families. And I won't go into the study, what we were looking at in transmission, but I wanna show you what type of information we try to collect from these kinds of samples. The other study we had is from um, NYU Langone. So the hospital system in New York early on in COVID-19, and these patients were on ventilators or respirators, and although they were on ventilators, they were healthy enough that they could also get what are called bronchoalveolar lavages, and that's where um, a buffer or water is Instill, distilled down to the lungs and sample is collected out and that's used to determine the health of the lungs. And so in this study, we were trying to see if microbes were involved in the outcomes and the outcomes we had were three groups of patients, patients who were on the ventilators for fewer than 28 days, some for more than 28 days and some who passed away uh, during the study period. And so these are considered, you know, the more than 28 days and deceased are considered, you know, a critical or um, bad outcomes and less than 28 days were good outcomes in this condition. These are patients who recovered. In all these types of studies, and I'm showing you two types of studies with respiratory infections, the idea behind the analyses is that first we have this very rich metagenomic and metatranscriptomic data, and we try to extract information from it. And the type of information you do in these microbiome studies is to understand the microbial community, but also the genes and pathways. And I won't go into that today, but what is different in these different individuals um, in the case of flu or no flu, or in the case of bad outcome or good outcome in COVID-19. And you can also look at antibiotic resistance. So we've published a few papers on these different characteristics in the microbiome studies. What I want to focus on more today, uh, because I want to talk about viruses, is phages and the interactions of phages and bacteria. So in this flu study first, and I have just very few snippets of data to show you, but uh, this is a PhD student who just graduated in my lab at NYU, Ling Di Zhang. And she analyzed, you know, 150 samples um, of by metagenomics and by metatranscriptomics. And this is a representation where you do an analysis to compare individuals from families that have flu infection be it high or low, and families with no flu infection. 
And we were trying to see whether their microbes or their bacteria in their upper respiratory tract were different. Does flu lead to a shift in your bacterial community? And we do see, for example, that the families that had no flu had an enrichment of these different species of coronary bacteria. And coronary bacteria are just commensals. They're natural members of your uh, airway flora, and they're often associated with health. And in fact, we think that these probably get knocked out in flu. And what I wanted to focus on here is that what we do see in flu is an enrichment of certain phages. So we have salmonella phages and the names mean nothing. So it doesn't mean that this person was infected with salmonella, but these phages were discovered probably in salmonella first and were called that way. But we still have little understanding of the, the range of phages and host associations that exist. And so that's an aspect we wanted to explore by looking at this airway microbiota. Now, if we look at our COVID patients, and this is a different representation of the data, and this, uh, ana these analyses were led by Matt Chung, who's at um, NIH uh, in my lab. And this is a representation here where we show enrichment of um, in different conditions in the deceased, we see by looking at the RNA viruses, eukaryotic viruses, we of course see a lot of SARS-CoV-2 and very little of these other respiratory viruses. And we see um, in phages that there's an association with death and with um, severity. So on a respirator for more than 28 days, we see association with staphylococcus phages. Um, and so these are other types of phages. So that kind of information we were interested in understanding what is happening in the airways with phages and what is going on. Now, why are we interested in phages? Well, phages have a very strong role to play in the microbiome and with their bacteria because bacteriophages need to infect bacteria cells to be able to propagate. And there are different types of phages and they can do different things. You have some phages that will integrate their genome into the genome of the bacteria and they can provide some beneficial genes. So there's very much of a symbiotic relationship in this case between the bacteria and the phages. And you have cases where phages will kill a competitor of another bacteria. So you can see uh, how bacteria populations will shift depending on the phage populations that exist. But one aspect we wanted to look at in the airways is how they interact together. And you can do this in different ways. And the more traditional way that is indirect is to look at what phages are there and what bacteria are there and see how they co-occur across different samples. But it's difficult because sometimes phages will kill their bacteria so that if you have a lot of a phage, you don't know what their host was. Sometimes they'll be present together at a high level, but you don't know really who has interacted with whom. But one way to do it is to look at the genome of the bacteria, because it turns out that the bacteria, and not all families of bacteria, but they have these CRISPRs. And I'm sure you've all heard of CRISPR. CRISPRs are used now very much in molecular biology to knock out genes. But CRISPRs are a bit the bacteria's immune system. And the way it works is that when a phage infects a bacteria, pieces of that genome get chopped up and get integrated into this array and this sequence where you have some of these repeats that are part of that bacterial genome, and then you have pieces of the virus. And these pieces correspond to these different phages that at one time 
and it could be very recently infected the phage. So basically the CRISPRs within these bacteria carry their own infection history. It's a bit like us with our antibodies. If I test your antibodies, I can know your infection history and bacteria do it in the same way. So we decided to use that information to identify hosts of these different phages that we're looking at. And we do it by taking all these metagenomic reads and mapping them back to bacteria and to viruses. And so this is what we would see um, at the end is a, a heat map. And this is simply a representation on the X axis of different types of phages that we identified and their hosts, different bacteria that we identified. And the colors represent, uh, the intensity of the colors represent the number of individuals in which we saw these associations. And what this shows you is that in some cases, there are bacteria, in this case, streptococcus, and you've all heard of streptococcus, that is a host to a variety of different phages. They can even be infected by staphylococcus phages. And there are also um, phages that are, um, that are promiscuous, that like to infect a lot of different bacteria. So you see different associations when you look at that. However, one thing to keep in mind again is that when we do these metagenomic studies, we tend to look at what we can map. We can map viruses, eukaryotic viruses, phages. We can map fungi, we can map bacteria. I can map the human genome that is part of that sample, but at least 25 to 30% of those sequences that are generated are unknown. They don't match anything. And that's what we call viral dark matter. Now, they don't match anything maybe for bioinformatics reasons that we're not able to do good mapping and a good alignment to what exists in the databases. And often it's because we haven't yet found a reference for that genome. And there's so much diversity that exists and novelty in the viral world that it's likely that there are new viruses in there that we just have never found. And so I wanna show you how um, some studies we've done on the New York wastewater and how um, we will use the same approaches to analyze our viral dark matter from our COVID-19 patients and from our flu patients. But here we did this first with the wastewater because we had far more data to work with. Now you saw in one of my first slides, the diversity of viruses and phages that exist in water and seawater. And it's true also in wastewater um, where we have very high diversity. So we had this study where uh, we were provided with raw sewage from the Department of Environmental um, uh, Health of, of the, I can't even remember what DEP stands for, it's terrible. But uh, that's basically what is cleaning your water in New York. And you can see all the, the borers here. I think somebody put it in the chat. Um, um, and here's Queens right here. And so samples were actually collected by Julia Maritz, who was a PhD student in the lab of Jane Carlton, who's a professor in biology at NYU. And they had done this metagenomic study and they had all this data. And so a student in my lab, Kristen Gulino, who graduated a year ago, Kristen decided to look for viruses in this viral dark matter. And in this case, viral dark matter defined as metagenomic sequences that originate from viruses, but do not align to any reference virus sequences. So again, you take your sequences, you try to assemble, you map. What doesn't map is likely something new. And so why do we want to characterize the metagenome of the sewage? Well, you know, virus discovery, but it's also an exploration of urban ecology. It's interesting to see what is going on in such a large uh, area uh, as we see in New York. And again, we're probing these dynamics of phage-host interactions. 
So when Kristen started looking at the data, we had 20 million sequences per each site. So we had very high depth and we could map a lot of these reads to humans, animals, plants, bacteria, fungi, unicellular organisms and viruses. And about 4% of our sequences were actually viruses. And when we looked at these viruses, so this, if you've never seen this kind of plot, it's called an upset plot, and it just shows you a histogram, and that's the number of unique species of viruses that we would detect. And here it shows you the different sites, and the little dots represent where we find these different viruses. So for example, we found core viruses. So all these viruses exist in all these different boroughs in New York. And this is what we found, um, the different phages, Salmonella, Lactococcus, Fecalibacterium um, that we find here. But there are certain phages, and here you see in Queens, there's a lot of unique diversity in, in Queens that we identified uh, from this analysis. But there's a lot of sources of sequences that match to nothing. So there's a way of analyzing it through what we call a tool to look for viral hallmark genes. And this is Veer Sorter. It's a tool created uh, quite a few years ago uh, by a group at JGI. Um, and this, um, they identified certain viral-like sequences, um, their hallmark of viruses. So there are certain genes that are hallmark. And doing that, you can predict certain viral contigs. I'm sure there are new tools now that exist, but that worked really well for us. And we use these tools to then um, also do an assembly that we matched our um, different clusters of sequences. So if I take my sequences and the colors represent different genes, and I can take all these individual, we call them contigs or contiguous sequences, and I can cluster them by how similar they are. And then you can map them back to references. And here there's a genome that exists in databases where this cluster matches, and I can give it a name based on the reference. But we also find a lot of clusters that are viral-like and that don't match anything. And that's what we're interested in. And so if you want to see the snapshot of Queens, what we see in Queens, this is a what we call a similarity network of these different clusters. And basically what you see, all the edges or these lines just represent all these little colored boxes or nodes that are different contigs and what they match to. If they're yellow, that means they didn't match any reference. However, when we do this kind of analyses, they tend to then be connected to colored boxes that are not yellow that are reference genomes. That means these unknowns can be put into groups or families of viruses that already exist. But we have a lot of these all yellow clusters that are complete unknowns. And we suspect these are new phages that haven't been identified yet. If I compare the Queens network to the Brooklyn network, this shows that in the Brooklyn network, more than 96% of these viral clusters are not associated with any references and they're complete unknowns. And so this type of analysis just tells you that there's great diversity. And what we try to understand in some of our analyses is where do these come from? And I won't go into all these details, but we do still try to find of some of these phages we identify um, are important because phage discovery has become really important. Phage, as you know, antimicrobial resistance has become super important. And phages were used a long time ago as a therapy to try to clear certain bacterial infections. It's very difficult to do when it's being 
reinitiated now as a field of study, um, but phages are important as reporters of the diversity that exists. You know, in this case, I'm showing the microbial gut, uh, but phages are probably very important. So um, exploring them in more depth is uh, warranted. And phages in the ecosystem are very important also because they're key regulators of microbial ecology. Just think of this. An infection in lysis can release organic matter. And it's thought that there's uh, about 10 to the 8 tons of carbon that are released per day due to phage infections of bacteria. And they're important also in um, cell respiration, metabolism, and they do all kinds of different things. And they kill 50% of bacteria every 48 hours. So um, just making a case for um, how this viral dark matter um, needs to be explored further. Now for the study of um, sewage, we actually, and I'm nearly done, uh, we did uh, do also this analysis of looking at phage host, uh, phage bacteria association, and we found about 929 of these different associations. Um, and so this, I just wanted to show you that if I take all my phages, like I showed you before these heat maps and all the bacteria, and these little boxes represent different groupings of bacteria and phage associations. And we call that modules and internal nestedness, meaning within these modules, there are phages that are promiscuous and some that are a specialists. So what we've learned from the virome from these genomic studies is that, uh, more importantly, there are a lot of novel uh, contigs to discover, and there's a lot of uh, virus discovery, and that um, there's a large host range of phages. And one, to conclude, we did find um, these novel viruses of viruses or these virophages. And this is a phylogenetic tree that shows in colors different pieces of contigs we identified in different boroughs. And these correspond to these different virophages. And virophages themselves are important. They're viruses of giant viruses. And giant viruses are a new discovery from, I would say, um, from 2005. So 15 years ago, giant viruses were discovered. And to show you what giant means in viruses, this is an E. coli bacteria. And this is so far one of the biggest viruses that's been discovered. You can actually see it in a microscope. And so these viruses, I mentioned these virophages infect these very large viruses and um, they uh, do impact algal blooms, just so you know. Uh, and so far, there had been only three virus phages previously discovered and sequenced, so ours fits within the Sputnik, but there are many more to discover. And so in summary, I took you really through um, viral dark matter as it stands in the whole world, as in emerging viruses, eukaryotic viruses, and many remain to be discovered. I showed you how, you know, hotspots of emergence are um, really linked to how we can do global surveillance and how virus genomics and new technology has really helped us um, be able to do surveillance, but even probe the unknown, in this case, this phage world. And I mentioned Ling Di, but there was also an undergraduate student who's now doing a master's with uh, Neville uh, Sanjana at the New York Genome Center. And these are some of the people in my group now at uh, NIH. Um, and some of my collaborators, Aubrey Gordon, who has the study in Nicaragua from which we did the flu studies, and Leo Segal and Luis Angel from NYU Langone, who provided those BAL samples from COVID patients. And these are my collaborators um, at Penn State on the virus device or the virion device. And Rich Bono, uh, who's at NYU, and Simons, who, uh, with whom we've been doing a lot of development 
of new tools. He develops the tools. I apply the tools on our metagenomics data um, in our studies. Thank you very much. Wonderful. I'll give a little audio applause uh, here so that there's not nothing. <laughs> Fascinating, interesting, frightening. There's so many ways to characterize uh, what we just learned here. It's, a, it's an amazing volume of work. Um, and uh, uh, I just wanna remind uh, folks that um, uh, Dr. Geddon's gonna stay and, and chat with the students afterwards. And so if, if there are student questions, you can certainly ask them now, uh, but you could also uh, hang on to them for the student session afterwards. But um, uh, for everyone uh, else attending, if you had any questions, there's there's some time still for discussion. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself, but if not, I can do my best to handle it. I like your comments. I'm looking at the chat now. <laughs> I like your comments, Tim. You're so funny. <laughs> and thanks. Well, Queens yeah. was the most diverse borough. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And thanks, Department of Environmental Protection. How did I not remember that? <laughs> uh, so you should be able to unmute, um, but I will. Uh, Isisa, you're unmuted. If um... yes, I am. Okay. Uh, can I ask my questions? Of course. <laughs> First, uh, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. It was such an impressively diverse uh, number of topics. So I'm sure our students um, we all enjoyed enjoyed it. Thank so you. again, thank you very much. So since it was too many topics, I have three questions. They're all short, but if I can make them, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll be brief. <laughs> First one has to do with the nanocarbon capture device. I'm just gonna ask you whether you're thinking about trying it for food safety purposes. Um, you know, we, we hadn't even thought of that. We were thinking so much about clinical samples, saliva, urine, uh, swabs, um, but yeah, it can be done for anything. Basically, you could do it for food um, and see if you know what kind of viruses. Now, you know, it, it wouldn't give you an answer on bacteria, and I know a lot of the the food infections are bacterial based, right? Um, I would assume, and we can't use it for that. Oh uh, yeah, but we have norovirus. We That's have, true. Uh, hepatitis A. We have a range of uh, uh, foodborne viruses that we can look for. I think it's promising. Oh, uh, wouldn't that be great on uh, boat cruises, for example? You're talking about yeah, yeah. We're talking yeah, about handheld device. I mean, yeah, this, yeah. this is really a game. Would be a game, game changer. changer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. My second question has to do with the microbiome and its effect on COVID uh, uh, severity, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, do you think that that's a, a, a primary consequence of uh, microbiome, or do you think it's an indirect consequence of differences in the immune system? Yes, so that's a, a good question. And it's the idea was that uh, because in any respiratory infection, you do get disruption of the microbiota. And in the case of flu, for example, we do see an enrichment, especially in children of Moraxella, which is, you know, what mm -hmm. causes the ear infections, right? And, uh, and so one of the questions was, if you take all these severely sick COVID-19 patients, and they come in and they have similar core morbidities, and they're all on ventilators, why is it that some of them, you know, after a week on a ventilator are fine. Some after you know, more than 28 days uh, on the ventilator and some will pass away. And it wasn't at all clear what the reason was. Now, so what we did is really a brute force approach with this. And we thought maybe we would pick up something that is different in these different individuals. And in fact, the microbiome is not all that different, uh, except that we did see um, Mycobacterium salivarium. So we did see one bacteria that appeared to be, it's relatively innocuous, but we did see it enriched and um, very much in the uh, severe, um, uh, severe outcome patients. 
but we think actually it's a combination of things. And it turns out that it was as simple as the viral titer, the number of SARS-CoV-2 virus particles that were present. If you look at the concentration, it was really ones that had a very high concentration of virus in their lower airways that um, seemed there was a clear correlation. Uh, but we saw there was a, a mix. We could look at how they responded. So we looked at their transcriptome also, the response, the viruses. We looked at the fungi. And so there was some candida in some of them. But there wasn't a clear microbial signature like you would see in flu. It wasn't that clear. Yeah. Okay. And the last question has to do with the uh, wastewater yes. and virus. Have you looked at for SARS-CoV? So I forgot to mention that we didn't, but it, it was funny because we published this paper right before the pandemic hit. And um, in fact, it's become a huge field that we did not start, but um, there are many people doing um, surveillance in wastewater because people are shedding SARS-CoV-2 in their stool. And it's used as a uh, sort of an indicator. And there are interesting studies where they've actually uh, been following people. And was it in... Um, it wasn't in the New York Times. I read something recently. Was it in that article in the New York Times where uh, people were saying, oh, yeah, no, we're not in contact and we're fine. And then they would find a high concentration of SARS-CoV-2 in the stool. And they uh, figured out that it was associated to somebody who was shedding and not aware that they were necessarily very sick. Um, so surveillance of wastewater has been done very much in certain parts of the world. Israel, for example, does a lot of wastewater surveillance for polio. Um, and so it's been done for viruses before. So it's a, not a new idea. Um, and it's very effective. I was just thinking maybe it would give us a little bit more indication when was the, where were the first cases of COVID in New York, because we still think it's beginning of 2020, but you it could know, be earlier. It, it could be, it could might as well be earlier than that. And I don't know if there are stored samples that date back to then, right? Um, yeah, that, that I was, I was, I was thinking about the same thing. I don't know whether yeah. they, they really keep them or just discard yeah, them. Yeah. The, the old now, what's interesting is when we were starting our metagenomic studies with the COVID patients and when we were um, uh, testing against databases of viruses, we weren't getting SARS-CoV-2 and we were barely getting the coronaviruses. And then we realized we're like, oh yeah, they hadn't put them in the databases yet. So, <laughs> so what you don't see is that it doesn't mean it's yeah, not sure. there. It's that your database is flawed. Okay, thank, thanks a lot. Thank you, Vicha. Laura, you had a question? Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. What an amazingly comprehensive talk. It was. And I touch on One Health, just for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy to hear you talk about phages and the microbiome and all of that. I just loved it. So I have two questions for you. And the first is, um, I'm a big proponent of phage therapy. Uh, you know, phages are the natural uh, foe of bacteria. Uh, what do you think it'll take for that to become wi a widespread reality in clinical practice? And two, just as we use blood chemistries and complete blood counts to monitor, you know, patient health, well being, or disease progression, uh, when do you think we'll start using the microbiome? to be able to monitor, track health and disease, or to even modify it uh, in response to diseases. You had some indication that some microbes were seem to be correlated with uh, more severe disease. Um, you know, that might potentially be a, a form of therapeutic, if you will, of modifying the microbiome. So, um, Really yep. eager to hear your thoughts on this. Thing. Yep. Very good question. So the first on phage therapy. So here's the problem with phage therapy is that bacteria develop resistance to phages. And that's been the biggest issue in phage therapy. Um, there are actually two issues. I don't even remember what the second one is. And it could be one of toxicity. There may be um, now we our immune system 
can respond. There is an interaction of some phages with our immune system. Um, and so I know there is another issue with phages. So that's been difficult. And phages, um, it, it has worked in the case of uh, clostridium, um, so C. difficile, right? There's been uh, studies, you know, where they have used specific phages for that. But the problem is that phages were, for many of them, we don't know how specialized they are. So they can, you know, deplete other microbes you do not want depleted. And when you do have these very specific associations, you have cases of, you um, uh, bacteria resistance to the phages. Now, I'm not an expert in that field, but that's what I've seen as some of the problems um, to surmount that uh, for clinical therapy using phage therapy. And so your second question is, so the, the microbiome field, there are various companies that exist that um, are planning to use the microbiota and to identify you know, combinations of the healthy microbiome. And if you could provide that as a pill, a desiccated pill, as therapy, uh, some are doing that, but it's, um, it's still difficult because we still don't know what all these bacteria do. Uh, we have a very small window into what we're looking at. There's a lot of things we don't see that may be necessary and that we haven't established their, um, their, their role. And as an example, we had a study we did actually with Rich Bono, uh, where we had taken um, microbiota data that we had. It was 16S ribosomal RNA data, so it wasn't metagenomics, but we had the 16S data of bacteria. And then we had the fungal data from the same individuals. And we analyzed these individually to see what seemed to interact together but when we put these networks together, we realized that fungi were having uh, an effect on the bacteria. And so we tested it in the lab where we took, you know, two bacteria with one fungus, and then we see what would happen. And just with our three-way interaction, it was super complicated. And now you're talking, you know, and dimension that is super um, difficult. So we haven't found like a V microbe that would solve the solution. And I think that's why we're not there yet for microbiome therapy, I would think. Thanks. Uh, one quick follow-up question on the phage. Don't the phages develop countermeasures? They evolve to counteract the uh, resistance. I mean, you know, this kind of tit for tat the whole CRISPR-Cas9 is the bacterial immune system and the phages evolved to counter the immune system. So they're kind of going back and forth, if you will. Yeah, but in therapy, do you really want something that evolves on its own and you don't know where it's going to go? That's always the, the caveat, right? I see, okay. Uh, evolution is uh, not a friend in therapy. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. It was terrific. You're very welcome. And I see there's um, a question in there. Yeah, if you save me the, the pain of reading that as an yeah. astronomer, that would be lovely. <laughs> Great. Is there potential for phages to incorporate back genes? Okay, I'm going to put my glasses on. Uh, unless, Shireen, you want to speak up? I see you right there in the middle of my screen. You can unmute yourself. Do you want to unmute yourself, Shireen? No, I guess not. So, so is there yeah. a potential for phases, phages Back to incorporate genes. bacterial genes? Oh, oh I see. That the conferverance yeah. factors that might allow for opportunistic infection of the eukaryotic tissues. Uh, uh, oh, she's having tech issues. Um, yeah, that's why she can't use the mic. That's all. Uh, I, I, I don't know. So you're saying whether a phage would transfer a gene. Now we see this in resistance where you would have, let's say, um, pathogenic bacteria that causes an effect on eukaryotic tissues, right? And phages can transfer antibiotic resistance genes. So that would be now virulence, whether it could make the bacteria more virulent. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Good point. 
any other questions? Uh, we will have a student session after this, so um, feel free. Uh, I would encourage all the students to hang around. Um, but if any other non-students have questions, really appreciate all the all the folks here from. I, I see faculty from from math and chemistry and bio oh, and great. physics. It's it's really been uh, been a wonderful turnout. Deb, did you have your hand up? Yes, I did. Uh, oh. Since there are no no other questions. Uh, a couple of them. You, you mentioned uh, something uh, which struck me, Morxella, and uh, uh, and in this context, when we came up with this uh, um, conjugate vaccine for streptococcus pneumonia, and uh, at that time, in which is now Pfizer vaccine research, we concentrated on things which will come after that, because when you kill all the um, uh, uh, a strip in there, somebody will come in. And Morosella was at the top of the list. So we did uh, patent a lot of this uh, antigens and everything of that. So do you see uh, these changes now that uh, streptococcus pneumonia vaccine has been there, the conjugate for, and it's mandatory for kids and it's been there for 20 years, so long and starting in 1999? I don't know because I'm looking at this point in time, right? So I, I can't, I'm not, linking it to any vaccine and they're all vaccinated yeah so yep so at point at one point probably you will see changes that is what we believe like oh yes okay. it used to be hemophilus and then hemophilus was gone yes uh, yeah and, and that that got taken over interesting okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. the other thing other thing uh, uh, you, you have also, since you have been so much into uh, filarial parasites, uh, and there's this big hoofla, not as bad as drinking uh, bleach, uh, about uh, use of ivermectin. And oh yes, yes, yes. So yes, I, I yeah. have been I have been bombarded with this question because oh, we were involved with question. the Mexican and other distribution. So. Uh, what is your opinion? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And I don't know the answer. And it's funny because I saw we, we have someone at NIH that every day sends what are in papers that people are talking about. And I saw today there was one on ivermectin and I haven't read it. So I don't know the answer. Um, they, I'm wondering if at NYU. So the thing is that NYU Langone, when the pandemic hit, they were using everything on, on these patients, right? They were using hydroxychloroquine, saw no difference, but you know, they were using bombarding everybody with every possible potential drug. And I know um, some are using, what have you seen, Deb, on uh, the results? Because some of these seem to be legitimate studies. So that's why I'm, uh, I'm surprised that ivermectin would make a difference, but it's a channel, it, it does, well, you're, the, you're the, the protein person, but uh, you know, what have you seen? So uh, the original uh, publication that was uh, retracted, Oh, it was. Yes, okay. it was retracted. And oh, I never thought one. I never thought anything about it. Unless one of our former colleagues at your college, she is now retired and is in Florida, called me up one morning. And it's a big story in elder people circle over there. And all I know is NIH is doing a trial that I know. Yeah. Right now, the late, latest is uh, back in India is 2-deoxyglucose. And because that's not to uh, fight the virus, but to fight the recovery right. back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. You know, I'll, I'll look because, uh, you know, when I saw that, I said, oh, I need to, to read up on that. That's interesting. So for those who don't know, ivermectin is used a lot uh, against worm infections, especially in certain uh, worm infections, um, uh, especially in cattle. It's used a lot also. Uh, so I'll check, that's a very good question. Thank you. And other thing is also from uh, that point, because you have been involved in uh, almost all the three filarial genomes, uh, Oncocerca volvulus, uh, um, Brugia malai, and Ukurira bancrofti. And, some, and particularly between Oncocerca and the lymphatic filariasis, there are obviously there are different things, but at the genome level, 
are they more related or more distant? What, yes. what did you say? Um, so at the genome level, they're very similar. And we actually mapped all the chromosome pieces. You know, we can actually see the evolution of, um, you know, their common ancestor, what it would have looked at like. I mean, they're, they're still, I mean, you know, they're pretty distant of if you look at what they do, but at the gene level, they have a lot of similar genes, a lot of orthologs. Um, their chromosomes are slightly different. It's like a rearrangement of portions of these chromosomes. And, um, and they also have a different representation. You know, our, our analyses were focused on sex evolution, sex chromosome evolution in these organisms. Uh, because, you know, the nematode that people know the most is C. elegans, which is a non-parasitic nematode and used a lot in genetic research. But the, the chromosome, there's some of them have an X, uh, but you don't see um, a Y like you see an XY, um, like you see in Oncocerca and the filaria. So parasites um, often have sex chromosomes and non-parasites don't need sex chromosomes. They don't need to have that same sort of diversity. Uh, but so they're, they're pretty similar. We can find most orthologs across the two genomes. They may do things that are completely different in both genomes, but they have a lot of the same gene complements. Um, uh, you know, the thing with these parasite genomes is that you always think that, aha, I'll find out why Oncocerca causes river blindness and lymphatic filariasis causes elephantiasis, but it's, you know, it, there's no clear marker of why they even uh, go through different tissues and how they do what they do uh, by looking at the genome, unfortunately. Let me ask one last question. And the carbon um, uh, tubes um, in, in this concept of filariasis, we used to collect uh, microfilaria uh, in Africa in the field. Mm -hmm. And do you think there's a use there? Uh, no, they're too big. Those too carbon big. nanotubes are really for virus sized things. You can't, you can't even do bacteria. It would clog the, the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. You're uh, welcome. Really enjoyed. Thank you. Great. Well, I'd like to invite all the students, please, to stay uh, to, to catch up with our speaker. And for everyone else, thank you so much. This was a, a year in, <laughs> in planning. Um, uh, thank you again, Elodie, for, for joining us today. My pleasure. I uh, really wish we could have toured our labs uh, yes. with you and things like that. But um, uh, it's, it's really been wonderful to have you. And thanks again to the Spurgle family. Uh, may, let's see what chemist the Spurgles bring to next year's meeting, right? We've, we've brought the astrophysicists, we've brought the, the public health specialists and next year, let's see what they can pull out of the family closet here for, for a chemistry speaker. <laughs> so um, <laughs> really looking forward to that. So thank you all for, uh, for coming this afternoon. Have, have a safe uh, and pleasant summer. And uh, students, please stick around for your questions for our speaker. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for your patience and uh, for your interest.